This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Mosley, and welcome to my new BBC Radio 4 podcast series, Stay Young. In each episode, I'll explore one simple, scientifically proven thing you can do to rejuvenate yourself from the inside out. Which will you try? Maybe a slice of mango to reduce your wrinkles. Mmm, delicious. Or learning something new to stay sharp. Hi, okay. Hi, okay. How about lifting some weights to protect your muscles against the ravages of time? (laughs) That was quite tough. To hear all about how to stay young, subscribe to the series wherever you get your podcasts. Hello there and welcome to the Inside Health Podcast. I'm James Gallagher and it's finally happening. We're talking zombies. Yeah, zombies. Somewhere out west, they're working on a cure. I think what really impressed them was the fact that I didn't turn into a monster. She so much as twitches. (laughs) That's a clip from the new TV drama The Last of Us. It's based on one of the best video games I've ever played. In it, a fungus called Cordyceps starts infecting people. It takes control of their bodies, zombifying them so that it can spread to yet more people. The result is a pandemic that collapses society. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. It sounds completely unbelievable. But Cordyceps fungus is real. It's known as the zombie fungus for the way it invades and takes over the minds of insects. Today, we're going to see if a fungal pandemic of any form is actually possible. So let's start with the zombie fungus. It's the speciality of Dr. Charissa De Baker, who's a microbiologist at Utrecht University. Charissa, welcome to Inside Health. And I suppose the first thing I want to know is someone who specializes in fungi looks at it all the time when you see a fungal apocalypse TV show. Are you thinking great or is your head in your hands? <laughs> That's a great question. So in one way, as a as a fan of fiction, like anyone else, I'm, I'm celebrating. On the other hand, as a scientist, I'm hoping that people, you know, don't go and interpret fungi the wrong way. It's a really interesting one, though, isn't it? Because they haven't used a made up fungus as part of this. It's cordyceps. It's out there in the real world. And it's called zombie ants, isn't it? It is called zombie ants. Yeah. But don't think these are undead ants. Uh, it's just that ant species that get infected with these fungi, the fungus will make the insects wander around in a very confused way and eventually climb up the vegetation. The insects uh, latch on and this is then where where the insect will get killed by the fungus so it can use all that energy to uh, produce a stalk and a fruiting body. So kind of like the, the mushroom of these type of fungi kind of emerges from behind the head to produce new spores and and spread to more ants. I first came across this, Sharissa, in a BBC documentary uh, series, Planet Earth, with David Attenborough. Have a listen to this. Like something out of science fiction, the fruiting body of the cordyceps erupts from the ant's head. It can take three weeks to grow, and when finished, the deadly spores will burst from its tip. Then any ant in the vicinity will be in serious risk of death. The fungus is so virulent, it can wipe out whole colonies of ants. Charissa, just listening to that, and I I remember watching it, it is the kind of things that horror movies are made of, isn't it? It kind of is, and this is also what attracted me to it. So you see these bizarre little insect statues with projections growing out of them which are which are the fungi obviously you know that kind of thing has been a part of the inspiration between this last of us series as well but i suppose the big question is does the science stack up that you can go from what happens to ants and is horrifying could that happen to people could these fungal species make the leap well, the very quick answer to that is is no. So the first thing is our body temperatures. Our body temperature is, is simply too high for most fungi to nicely settle and grow. And this is the same for this cordyceps. Of course, their their nervous system is simpler than, than ours. So definitely uh, it, it would be easier to hijack the brain of an insect versus versus our brain also their their immune systems are very different from ours as well so for this fungus to be able to 
jump from an insect to us and cause an infection is already a, a very big leap. Dr. Shrisa De Becker there. And I'll be honest, it is a relief, isn't it, that we're going to dodge the zombie apocalypse. But let's be honest, we're not off the hook yet because there are more fungi, millions of species of them, and a few of them are becoming increasingly problematic. So I went to meet Dr. Neil Stone. He's the lead for fungal infections at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases in London, and he's at the front line of the fight against fungi. I think we underestimate fungal infections at our peril, and I think we've already done that for too long. And we are completely unprepared for dealing with a fungal pandemic. Yes, it's true, most fungal infections don't pass from person to person. So I think a fungal pandemic will take a slightly different form. The most worrying, I would say, for us at this point is something called Candida auris. This is a yeast in the Candida uh, species, which are generally very common. But Candida auris itself was only discovered in 2009. The most important thing about it is that it's incredibly drug resistant. The fact it's been called the first fungal superbug, uh, it's really worrying and it could come to uh, become a major healthcare problem. In fact, the head of the fungal department at the CDC in Atlanta called it a creature from the Black Lagoon, which has bubbled up and is now everywhere. And I think that's a very good way of thinking about it. It's like a monster which has appeared only in the last 10, 15 years or so, but is now being found all over the world. So if you have somebody who comes in with that and there's no drug you can use, what do you do? It's extremely difficult. It seems very, very hard to stop transmission once it gets into a hospital setting. It seems to stick to surfaces, it's transmitted in intravenous lines, catheters, even blood pressure cuffs, which are being used patient to patient. Uh, And standard cleaning measures have proved ineffective to the point whole intensive care units had to be shut down. Most of the time, I'm pleased to say, even Candida auris is susceptible to at least one of the antifungal agents we have, but sometimes none at all. And this is a a real problem. And that's in the UK? More than one uh, intensive care department of large hospitals in the United Kingdom, which actually had to shut their doors. If it spreads uh, into uh, almost every hospital that we have patients at the moment, it could shut down entire healthcare systems. So even though the nature of the pandemic may be very different from what we're used to now with, for example, COVID, it could have a profound and massive impact internationally on healthcare. This problem is big, it's growing, and it's only going to get bigger. And I think we ignore it at our peril. Fungal infections are slightly different in that, yes, most of these organisms occur in the environment. Yes, they do tend to affect only those who are immune suppressed. But at the same time, I think the pure volume of fungi in the environment only going to increase between climate change, between international travel, the increasing number of cases and their deep neglect in terms of treatments we have. When I think of fungus, I think of mushrooms when I go walking through the woods or something like that. You know, they're nature's great decomposers and recyclers. Is that what they're doing to the human body when they get in? I think that's exactly right. And it's not very pleasant to think about. Uh, Somebody once said that fungi are the interface organism between life and death. The WHO actually just uh, very recently released a list of what they call the fungal priority pathogens, where they've identified the top three in the the critical category are Candida auris, uh, and you will see an example of this in the laboratory, Aspergillus fumigatus, which is a common environmental mold but causes very severe lung infections, and Cryptococcus neoformans, which causes devastating and life-threatening fungal meningitis. Well, we heard Neil talking about Canada auris. I find it shocking to think how that has just come from nowhere in the space of a decade and a half. But let's have a look at another one he mentioned, Cryptococcus neoformins. Dr. Irina Drugina from Kew Gardens explains where it comes from in the environment. Cryptococcus neoformans can be found in soil and feed off dead organic matter, and that can also feed on bird droppings or in the cities it can be found in pigeon droppings. The major feature of this fungus that makes it dangerous for humans is that they're so resistant to stress conditions that we know that it grows in their parts of the melted Chernobyl nuclear power plant. And if I would be thinking about the plot for a TV series, I would actually consider uh, this fungus because it certainly has affinity to human brain and can cause meningitis in humans. Are we all set for the night? Yeah, I've almost finished the lasagna. Great. What kind of lasagna? Uh, like a Ellie lasagna. and Sid are enjoying married life um, now. How did the cake go, by the way? Is the cake ready? <laughs> <laughs> it's 
The cake didn't go brilliantly. I know. Why? Yeah. But it was a very rocky start. Just days after their wedding, the fungus Cryptococcus neoformans took hold in Ellie's body. Ellie and Sid, welcome to Inside Health. Hi. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. Ellie, can you tell me what was the last thing you can remember? When did it all begin? So I remember packing up for our wedding. That's the last thing I remember. Thankfully, I remember the wedding, which there were concerns that I might not. And then two days after the wedding, this was the end of July, we were flying to Costa Rica. But I don't remember that. So Costa Rica was the luxury honeymoon? Yeah, exactly. Five days in Costa Rica along the beaches there, and then we went to an off-grid island. At least I was getting headaches. And then we thought maybe it's, you know, a bit of the sun. She just had a lot of water. Started feeling better in a couple of hours. And the next day, we went snorkeling in the morning. (laughs) But then once we came back, she felt like a bit nauseous, a bit dizzy. And then she started like throwing up. There was only two people in this whole island. Um, (laughs) The hotel owners, she like asked Ellie to go into the shower. And that's my final, final memory, really. My final memory is being like put into the shower and her just saying you're overheating. And so did you think it was just the heat too? At that point, I kind of thought it was. While Ellie at that point, she knew something was wrong. She was like, I need to go to the doctor. Basically, the hotel owners were like, there are no doctors here. And we would need to take a boat. Ellie was becoming less responsive. She was having like jerk-like motions, full-blown seizures on the bed. And I have yeah, never seen something... Um, yeah, more like horrifying and especially feeling so helpless. People started to take it seriously then, as you've told me. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like we had to actually carry Ellie in a hammock while she was still having the seizures to the boat and then take like a 30 minute boat ride. Sid, it sounds terrifying and Ellie, it feels like it's probably, probably glad you can't remember it. Yeah, it feels very weird that this happened to my body. I was just very scared and... When we got there, like they were, they were phenomenal. I mean, I I didn't understand, speak the language, and I mean, there was no cue. And immediately, she was seen as a priority. They initially suspected it's like hyponatremia, so basically low sodium levels, then that could lead to things like seizures, diarrhea. But they said they also saw there was like an infection because the white blood cells were elevated. So they were like, okay, we need to move to the next place because Ellie needs to have intubation support in her breathing. And when did they realise that it was a fungal infection that was the problem? They did a CT scan, they saw swelling um, in the brain and they did a full like meningitis panel array test. The PCR said like cryptococcus like positive. So that's when they figured out that it's a fungal meningitis. Crikey, what did you think when well, I have to ask you, Sid, because Ellie, I, I don't think you still remember this bit. So, Sid, what did you think when you found out it was fungal meningitis? Well, I mean, I, I was very confused. The family had flew, flew over, Ellie's family had flew over, and my best friend as well. We saw that it mainly affects people with immunity that's like compromised. And um, that didn't quite make sense because Ellie had a very good immunity as far as we know that. But they started treating her and then... While she was in ICU, she was stable and that was the important thing. So that means it was she was responding to the treatment. So that's why we were like, okay, probably is this. Mm. And Ellie, when did you start to come around? I was on the ventilator for 12 days. Um, So they started to wake me up. That was traumatic because I didn't know where I was. My arms were strapped down by my side. So I just remember screaming was very um, confused. I had a lot of delusions. I thought we talked a lot about like having kids on the honeymoon and stuff. And I thought we did have three triplets, which I was very, very relieved when I finally did come to like realize that that wasn't (laughs) true. I was relieved. Um, And yeah, I mean, I, I also didn't trust Sid. I thought he'd like gambled our money away. So the first thing I said to him was it's over. That was the first thing I said to him. And for a couple of days, just really didn't trust Sid at all. But gradually kind of started to understand what was going on and very thankful to be alive but also not really understanding the seriousness of what happened and still felt like I'd be able to walk fine and and I couldn't I'd lost about 25% of my muscle mass I couldn't stand anymore so I was having to do physio and was in hospital for about I think seven days after waking up which is pretty quick (laughs) and yeah flew home and the physical side of recovery was 
straightforward, really. But the mental side was, yeah, catastrophic, really. Um, as soon as we got back, I think the adrenaline kind of subsided and the PTSD, like, I mean, I just, you know, you don't think you're going to go on your honeymoon and almost die. Had you ever really thought that fungal infections could do this? Never. <laughs> no? No. I wish you a long and happy marriage, both of you. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> this was good to do for me as well. Um, it's quite, quite cathartic to just to talk about it. And also be, be in a good enough place. That's it, isn't it? Because for a long time I couldn't talk about it. So, yeah. Ellie, I want you to imagine something for me. Mm -hmm. Take a pregnancy test. <laughs> you go for the first ultrasound scan and they go, it's triplet. Oh, my God. Don't. I just... Oh, I, I mean, it'll be a great story if it does happen. <laughs> now, Neil, we've just heard from one of your patients, Ellie. That is some story. It is an incredible story, and actually it's a very scary and frightening experience. And people think of meningitis usually as being caused by bacteria, but actually in many parts of Africa, for example, the most common form of meningitis is a fungal meningitis caused by cryptococcus. And most people with a healthy immune system control the infection there and then and are probably never aware they were even exposed to it. In patients with weakened immune systems in particular, for example, those patients who have advanced HIV, it can actually disseminate and spread around the body and actually enter the nervous system and cause a very devastating form of meningitis. Just the yeast growing. That's the yeast growing in, in the, the, brain the brain and the spinal fluid, yeah. What Ellie had was this fungal infection, cryptococcal meningitis, which has got a high mortality and can be absolutely life-threatening. Although in her particular case, there was no known immune suppression. And we do know there are cases where this can happen to people who are apparently otherwise healthy. It's a big lesson in that case, isn't it? I think there's a lesson that we shouldn't underestimate these. It is rare, I would uh, uh, remind people of that, but it's something that uh, we are increasingly seeing and, and delighted that she's come through it as well now. I find it quite sobering, to be honest, because like, it's very easy to dismiss fungal infections, because if someone goes fungal infection, the first thing that comes to my mind is something like athlete's foot. Or something that you, you know, and actually, we're talking about something that can be life or death. Absolutely, and I think that's something that I battle people think of it as something trivial or superficial or unimportant or vaguely embarrassing. Whereas, in fact, around the world, they're responsible for more deaths than something like malaria, for example, which I think more people would be aware of. More deaths than malaria? Fungal infection or invasive fungal infection are estimated to cause almost three times as number of deaths every year as malaria. How have we ended up in a place where we're not more worried about it than we are? The exact reasons why that is is, is to me, somewhat of a mystery. Maybe some kind of deep cultural relationship with fungi that it's something odd and bizarre that people don't really want to pay attention to. And as a result, we've had a lack of investment and a lack of treatments available. We actually only have three classes of antifungal drugs we can use compared to, for example, antibacterial agents and now antiviral agents where there are dozens. What got you into fungus? Because as you say, most people go, meh. I'm often asked that question and I, I didn't go into this uh, profession of medicine with the intention of being a specialist in fungal diseases. I was interested in HIV in particular, and I spent some time in Malawi in Southern Africa. And I'd never heard of cryptococcal meningitis, and all of a sudden I was seeing cases of it every single day. That was largely related to the HIV epidemic, which is ongoing in that part of the world. As a result, cryptococcal meningitis, a fungal meningitis, it was and is extremely common there. So I became interested in, in cryptococcus. I started to make connections with others in the field and uh, it grew from there. So we're going to go through to the culture laboratory. So this is where we do most of our fungal culture. Um, the reason we're behind a couple of locked doors is fungi produce spores. So everyone thinks that fungi are going to invade the world because they produce spores, but they really don't. They're quite nice and friendly. So we just pass through this door. Do we need to wear a lab coat in there? Uh, you're all right. We're OK, because we're just observing. Hello, my name is Rebecca, Rebecca Gorton. I'm a clinical scientist at Health Services Laboratories specialising in fungal infection. And what have you got for me today? So what I'm going to try and do is give you a flavour of what we do on a daily basis to diagnose fungal infection. So if you have somebody in hospital, suspected fungal infection, yeah. this is where the samples come? Yes, the plates are referred up to the specialist laboratory here. Uh, and the reason for that is that this laboratory, because it's full of fungus, can get quite... Smelly? Fungusy, smelly, yeah, dirty. But gets lots of spores in the environment. So what you wouldn't do here is process a sterile sample because you might risk contamination. So you've got a row of Petri dishes for me, each growing something... Yeah. 
yucky inside them. I do. So we've got some nice chromogenic media. And chrome agar is lovely because it makes things go a nice colour. And actually what you can see growing here, and I won't take the lid off, is a candida auris culture. I've heard of that one. Yes. Candida auris is our superbug media. Can I have a look? Yeah, of course you can. Um, just don't touch it. <laughs> and I don't want to stick my face in it either. Um, so it's just a white waxy colony, and that's a standard candida culture. Tiny little white blobs, and I'm getting a really... So did um, I just get a yeasty waft then? You did, yeah. It smells Which reminded me of bacon. A brewery, yeah, or bacon, yeah. <laughs> But actually, what's really important about Candida auris is it is multi-drug resistant. And we just look to see if the Candida grows in the presence of the, of the drug. different drugs. Yeah. yeah. And you can see for Candida auris there in the plate that we've got this lovely uniform pink colour across all the wells at the bottom here. Is and that the, a good colour or a bad colour? That's a bad colour. Okay. Um, so if it grows in the presence of the drug, it means it's resistant. But if you look in comparison to the lovely green Candida albicans um, test that we've got here, Your you can see blue. it hasn't grown, it's yeah. not gone pink. So it's not growing in the presence of the drug, and therefore we can say it's susceptible to those treatments and give the clinicians advice on how to manage. Okay, so it's invaluable work being able to Absolutely. tease us apart when you're dealing with a superbug. Yeah. What are these two? Yeah, so these are in bags, is that because they're yeah, even worse? Yeah, these are the ones that make the spores. So Candida okay. can is relatively quick, grows within 24 to 48 hours, and we can quickly do something. In contrast, the other group of fungi are filamentous fungi. It's the stuff that grows out in the environment, in the soil, but it's also the stuff that can grow in patients' lungs when they breathe the spores in. So what I've got for you here are two typical examples of fungi that we isolate. So I'm getting mouldy bread vibes. Yeah, mouldy bread. So Aspergillus fumigatus is the first colony. It's this lovely navy blue colour with a lovely white edge, and this is the one that makes your bread go blue. It grows within three to five days, so, you know, it's not quick. So it can take a while to diagnose these infections. Um, but once we isolate Aspergillus fumigatus, in a patient who we suspect an infection, so they've got a high probability of infection, we would treat that as a significant result, and then we would, we would investigate the patient further. Um, so that's Aspergillus. And then the second culture that I'm showing you is slightly more scary to look at. Um, and this is called a mucoraceous fungus. We call oh, them. You have all the great words in yeah, we do. fungal research, um, don't you? It, it's called a lid lifter. Um, and the reason it's a lid lifter is on the agar plate. Yep. Don't worry, I'm going to take the lid off. You will not come to any harm. Um, <laughs> I've unconsciously backed away. <laughs> <laughs> it grows so quickly. This is within 24 hours. And it fills the agar plate that it can lift the lid off the plate. So we okay, call so that's them a lid super lifters. fast growing one. Yeah. yeah, they are the thing that rots your thinking, fruit. You're feeling very really quickly. cavalier with yeah, this. Yeah, I'm all right with this. But, so they're the thing that uh, they're the fungus that when you have a piece of fruit and the next day it's turned to mush, that's yeah. because it's it's had a mucor fungus inside of it. And this is a really serious infection in the wrong patient. So if you have an immunocompromised patient who ends up with an infection. Um, and typically we see this in patients who are very sick, then this grows as quick in their tissues. So That's you can terrifying. see how quickly that that could progress. It's very rare. don't want everyone to be scared that they're going to get a mucor infection. I should say we see a case of this, we call it mucor mycosis, uh, which is a very rapidly growing fungus, which is present everywhere in the environment. It's absolutely harmless to most people, but in the right patient setting for it, usually a patient with poorly controlled diabetes, or undergoing cancer chemotherapy, it can start to spread very quickly and develop over a matter of hours and days. In the laboratory, overnight growth can actually cause it to lift the lid off the agar plate. If you can imagine, in a patient who is susceptible, it can actually grow as rapidly as that in the patient's tissues. For example, the face or the eyes and even the brain and is often fatal and those who do survive are often left with severe facial disfigurement. And we have very few tools to deal with this so we're in desperate need of new drugs to treat it and new diagnostics to actually pick this up quicker. And I think anyone who's seen a case of that uh, won't forget it quickly. Quite horrifying to think of that happening to somebody you it's know the, or to it, anybody, really. It's devastating, and it's, it's something, fortunately, we see uh, only a handful of times per year. It is on the increase, however, for example, in India with the COVID pandemic, there was an explosion of these cases. Suddenly it was headlines everywhere. That's right. That's something which the media actually called black fungus. This probably wasn't as a result of the COVID virus itself, but because a lot of patients with COVID were taking large doses of steroids, which is a risk factor. Diabetes is extremely common in India, and a lot of these patients have poorly controlled diabetes. And there was a huge number of cases there following one of these COVID waves. Another example there of just... 
where the opportunity is there, the fungus is just waiting. Absolutely. And that's why we call these opportunistic pathogens. Most of the time, they don't cause any problems. But when they find the right patient or the wrong patient, depending on how you look at it, they can cause devastating disease. Most fungal infections do affect those with weakened immune systems. Now, there are more people with uh, suppressed immune systems than ever before. That's partly for a very good reason, is that treatments for previously almost universally fatal diseases, such as leukemia, for example, there are now very sophisticated treatments which are keeping people alive longer, which is obviously great. But in order to do so, these patients are being more heavily immunosuppressed and for longer than ever before. So the pool of susceptible people to these infections is ever growing. The horrible things fungi can do to our bodies is quite chilling, isn't it? In a moment, we're going to hear from Caroline. She had an aspergillus infection in her lungs, and that's another of those fungi that are causing concern. But first, Dr. Irina Jujina explains where it comes from. Potentially, potentially dangerous are spergillus albicotos. They are everywhere because these fungi, they uh, live in dead organic matter and particularly in forest soil, forest litter, and they are so abundant that every one of us daily inhales maybe hundreds of spores of this fungus, and even if we stay indoor. So how do they end up everywhere if they're normally kind of like in the forests? These are mold. They produce really vast number of spores. The spores are very, very small. And they, they, we, we bring them every time we enter, we bring some air with us, like, like in this studio. Caroline, welcome to Inside Health. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. So tell me, what happened with you and a fungal infection? <laughs> I had already got shortness of breath as a result of um, asthma and then as a result of a, a heart disease. So when I then got... A further cough, everybody thought it was, oh, it was infection probably or the heart. I coughed all night and nobody ever thinks of fungus straight away. Um, so it took a long time to diagnose. In fact, I started coughing up phlegm with a little bit of fine black threads in it. Now, every doctor oh, thinks that's that. unusual. To me, it looked like fungus. And eventually it came back with a diagnosis of aspergillus and I'm being admitted to hospital because I was very sick then. What I had was complications from the steroids that I was on for my heart disease. And also, I before that, I had been taking tablets that reduced my immunity for my arthritis. Talking to my infectious diseases consultant, he says it's quite likely that those black threads were the black threads of the, the fungus. I had lumps in my lung with holes in them containing fluid, and they thought it was cancer. So we thought asthma, we thought potentially cancer, well, we, knew, we thought I, infection. How long did it take to get to fungus? So it took a long time. And during that time, I'd been in hospital one, two times, and nobody had really picked it up. So it was a difficult diagnosis, and I was on treatment for 12 months. Oh, that took a while to clear up. It does take a long time to clear up, and it's um, you're never quite sure if it's completely gone. So for the rest of my life, we have to check from time to time. The problem is because... I, like many other people, have to stay on tablets that reduce your immunity. It makes it more likely that it might come back. Caroline, thank you so much for coming on the programme. You're welcome. Again, like most of these, that's an environmental organism. Aspergillus is all around us. We're probably breathing it in right now, in fact. For most people, it doesn't cause any problems. But if you have risk factors for disease, for example, if you have damaged lungs from an underlying lung condition or you're on immunosuppressive therapy, including, for example, long-term steroid use for another condition, it makes you vulnerable to actually getting disease with aspergillus. And aspergillus particularly likes the lungs as a place to cause disease because that's the point of entry when you breathe in spores. And it can cause a, a chronic kind of lung infection, and symptoms can include a chronic cough, coughing up blood. We can actually see if we do a chest X-ray or a CT scan of the chest, we will see lesions there. And that's uh, how the disease manifests itself when this environmental fungus encounters a person who's susceptible to infection. And Neil, are our homes a danger as well? Because we we had that case last year of, you know, a child who was concluded that it was the black mould in their home that was the cause of death. Absolutely. I think I would say that case is very rare, but it's another, another example of these are organisms which live naturally in the environment. But if they 
start to grow in quantities which can overwhelm, for example, in this case, sadly, a young child, then certainly that can become a threat to human health. Neil, just thinking into the future, are there new antifungal drugs on the horizon? Is the work being done? The good news is that after decades of neglect, there finally is some progress with new antifungal drugs. And I'm very hopeful within the next five to 10 years, we'll have a vastly greater array of antifungal drugs to deal with some of these infections. We're on the cusp of some really positive change. Just a quick thought about the biology of fungi, Neil. Are they, well, they're obviously so different to other forms of life on Earth. Does that make them harder to develop drugs for? Because you can't really borrow from other things because they're so different. Yeah, they are particularly difficult to treat. So actually fungal cells are actually very similar to human cells. They're much more similar to human cells than, for example, bacteria are or viruses are. That makes developing drugs actually very tricky because if you have a drug which targets a fungal cell, often a side effect will be that it will actually attack human cells and cause all kinds of toxicities. So many of the antifungal drugs commonly used can actually have side effects which can affect the kidneys, for example, can cause anemia because of the similarity between the human cell and the fungal cell. So designing drugs to treat them has been particularly difficult and challenging. Did treating all of these cases, Neil, put you off eating mushrooms? Actually, I have to say I love mushrooms. I I think they're one of the most delicious foods. And most mushrooms that we eat cause no disease whatsoever. One of the things I've learned that actually fungal diseases are only a small part of what the fungal kingdom does for us. Neil, thank you so much for having me in. You're welcome. And thank you for joining me for an exploration of the world of deadly